Okay, so off we go. I hope everybody had a good spring break. Um, I hope you had maybe just a little bit of time to look at a little bit of math, maybe just a little bit. Uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, of course, uh, while we're on that topic, I'll remind you, we have a midterm exam coming up on Friday, right? So uh, make sure to, you know, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it open-ended as the earlier you start, you know, preparing, uh, the, the better. So. Okay, all right, so picking up from where we left off last time, uh, we were talking about these symmetry theorems, and so uh, the single variable version that you you know seen in uh, ho hopefully in a single variable calculus class as a f familiar statement, integrals are just zero if two easily checked conditions are satisfied. Um, and uh, you know we talked a little bit about you know why that might be, and you can take this sort of canceling terms in the Riemann sum point of view, which is uh, I don't know arguably the most direct way to see it. Um, but if you maybe don't trust your intuition with Riemann sums, or uh, if you're a little afraid of uh, I don't know something about this that might be a little uncomfortable, um, substitution crushes this problem, right? So you can just use. The, the negative sign, x equals negative u, as the substitution. Uh, that substitution is right there. And then combined with the symmetry of the domain, which is why uh, the uh, interval is its own reflection, uh, and then combined furthermore with the fact that the function is odd, Right, so the value of the function at negative u is the negative of the value of the function at u. Um, what we end up showing with just a little bit of algebra is that this integral is uh, its own negative, and there's only one number that is its own negative. That's zero. So lovely little proof. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so uh, where we uh, left off last time is in uh, tr generalizing this to two dimensions. So uh, in particular, the, we have to generalize the idea of what does it mean to you know, take a point and kind of flip it over the origin, right? That's what, when you, when you put a minus sign on a value of x, you're effectively reflecting over the origin. So when you have two dimensions, you don't reflect over points, you reflect over lines, right? And a reflection over a line, again, is exactly what you would think. It's, uh, you know, it's where the mirror image is. Right, if you imagine the line representing a mirror, and if x is where you are, then r of x is where you see your reflection. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, we have analogous definitions of odd. Odd just means you get a minus sign when you reflect the input. Totally analogous to what we did in single variable. Right? It's just now it's a two-dimensional reflection instead of a one-dimensional reflection. Um, and... The, again, the idea of what does it mean uh, for a domain to be symmetric? Well, the idea of symmetry is that the domain is its own reflection, um, which you can write like this uh, in several different ways you could write that. So with all of that generalization having been made, great news, we get the same, yeah, morally the same theorem. And that is if you have an integral and if the integrand is odd, and if the domain is symmetric, then your integral is zero. You don't have to think about how to slice up that domain and worry about hidden corners and worrying about whether the bounds on the inside integral are going to muck up your outside integral, right? All of that stuff, all the headaches that come from doing a double integral, poof, gone. Don't even have to mess with it. Answer is zero. Walk away. Awesome. Awesome theorem. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of warnings. Uh, the, the downside of symmetry arguments, and I am a fan. I am a huge fan. But there is a downside, uh, and uh, you do have to be careful. So both conditions have to hold. Right? It's important that they both hold. If you just have a symmetric domain... Uh, the integral is not necessarily zero. That would be silly. It's, I mean, implausible, right? The oddness of the integrand is really, really important. And then likewise, just because you have an odd integrand, not good enough. You need that domain to be symmetric, right? So be very, very careful. Please uh, make sure that you um, confirm. I'm going to give you a detailed list of exactly what I want to see. Um, but... Uh, Make sure that both of these conditions actually hold. Um, second, 
uh, uh, easy, easily mistaken uh, uh, thing is you do have to use the same line uh, for both of these. Odd over one line, but symmetric over a different line. The argument just doesn't work. Okay, and we'll see an example of that as well. Okay, so again, you can prove it two different ways. Uh, you can, we'll start with the Riemann sum point of view. So again, canceling terms in the Riemann sum. Totally analogous, right? This term in the Riemann sum and uh, this term in the Riemann sum, because of the symmetry, they'll correspond. Because of the oddness, they're negatives of each other, so they will always cancel and nothing's left, everything cancels in a puff of smoke and the integral is zero. So again, if you're comfortable with the idea of Riemann sums, which again, fundamentally is what integrals are, right? Uh, then uh, this is, I think, the most direct and easy way to see it. But if you would rather something more algebraic, there is also this argument here. Uh, let's see, I guess I'll bring that up. Um, where again, I'm doing a pullback through a reflection this is just a pullback. You can see I've uh, got the stretching factor in here. Of course, the stretching factor is 1 with a reflection. right? So nice, easy argument there. Uh, so aside from the pullback, notice all we need to use is that the domain is its own reflection, namely symmetric domain, and that the value of the function at the reflection, oh, uh, I, I've already used that color, sorry. Uh, the value of the function at the reflection is the negative of the value at the function uh, at the uh, at the unreflected. And then again, the integral is its own negative. That means it must be zero. So nice little uh, quick little argument. By the way, this is why I like to cover this material in the section on uh, change of variables because it is literally a change of variables pullback that makes this argument work. Okay. All right, so let's do one. Let's actually compute an integral. Uh, here it is. This is the integral I want to compute. And <clears throat> uh, yikes, right? I think we can all agree that's a yikes. And in a couple of ways, because look at this. Uh, not only is my integrand kind of scary looking, right? But look at my, my, uh, my curves, these two curves that define my shape. And in particular, you look at this one, and I can kind of see this coming. Obviously, I'm not going to solve for x in terms of y. That'd be oh, this is not even possible. But I can, but I can solve for y in terms of x. So I'm anticipating this quartic being in my inside bounds, which means this quartic is going to go right in there and make it even uglier. <laughs> right, so this, if you want to brute force go straight at it, compute that integral. It's brutal. Right. So uh, let's uh, instead uh, use a symmetry argument. Um, we do have to draw our domain. I'll make a quick sketch of what this domain looks like. Um, so here's my x, y axes. Uh, let's see here. This curve, this is a, a uh, quartic, of course, and you can see that, well, flashback to Calc 1. Right? you got to remember how your curve sketching works. Um, and this is, uh, there's kind of a parabola and sort of an upside down super parabola, I don't, you know, whatever you want to call this. Uh, and roughly speaking, that curve is going to look like that. And then, of course, there's the y equals negative 1, which is going to look something like that. And now I'm going to do mostly a hand-waving appeal. This is symmetric. Does everybody buy it? based on the look. Now, if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, in particular, how do I know what's the argument to persuade me that this curve right here is symmetric? Um, well, that's uh, you can argue that by uh, what I've got written down down here. Uh, if you just plug in the formula for our reflection over the y-axis, namely replace all the x's with minus x's, the equation doesn't change. And so that argues that when you reflect, this curve is its own reflection, and therefore it's symmetric. Okay. All right, so very importantly, um, <clears throat> this curve is symmetric over the y-axis. The formula for reflection over the y-axis is like this. Now let's take a moment to 
to think this through. If I if I have some point x comma y over here, right, and if I reflect over the y-axis, and let me draw, uh, if I have a point here, and if I reflect to there, that reflection is going to keep the same value of y, but it's going to have an x coordinate that's the negative of what it started with. That's when you reflect over the y axis. Now, that's a geometric appeal. Does everybody see that geometric appeal? Yeah? Uh, let's, let's suppose that you don't really know what the graph of x squared minus x to the fourth Yeah, then it becomes like, a much there, harder problem. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so sadly, you know, you know, I like the metaphor of tools in the toolbox, right? And not all problems have perfect solutions for which there is a single tool. Yeah, so, so what you describe is a situation where a symmetry argument would either be very difficult to make or possibly the symmetry wouldn't even apply. And sadly, yeah, that's going to happen sometimes. But so nevertheless, symmetry is useful in many cases such as this one. Yeah, is that satisfying? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's as good as it's going to get, I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, we have a symmetric domain over the uh, y-axis with that formula for reflection. Now, uh, we do need, I emphasize, right, um, not only to know that the domain is symmetric. Not good enough. Right? You also have to know that the function has odd symmetry. And uh, this is one where it's really not... Hmm, yeah, you really need to show the algebra on a function being odd. Uh, it's a very algebraic statement, right? Uh, it's not a geometric appeal that you can just, well, you know, look at it, you know, kind of thing. Uh, so we're going to have to algebraically write down uh, the, uh, the oddness. Now, keep in mind, we've already talked about the formula for the reflection. Here it is. This is how you reflect. And so I have to take... Um, Let's see here, showing oddness, I'll use, I'll use blue. Um, I have to look at the value of the function at the reflection and compare it to the value of the function at the unreflected point. Specifically, I have this formula for my reflection, so the reflection, I plug in like that. Everybody with me? Now, there's a tricky little bit here, and that is how do you plug in uh, for, uh, let's see here, again, color choices, I'll use dark blue. How do, I, how do I compute this? And keep in mind, we have a formula for f, right? Our f function, this function f is right there, <coughs> right? So notice what I'm doing, though, in particular, I am plugging in uh, I am not plugging in x for x and y for y. I'm plugging in negative x from the reflection, right? I'm plugging in negative x for x. All right, and thus uh, I get, uh, well, you know, the formula for the function. But everywhere I had seen an x, I put negative x. So up here where I have x cubed, now it's now negative x that gets cubed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And now we've got to take this expression, uh, f at the reflection, and we've got to <coughs> start doing algebra and manipulating it around and see what it becomes and see if, as it's supposed to, does it actually equal to the negative of the original value of the function. And you do this algebra, and sure enough, yes, it is. And so this function is odd. So you got to do this algebra. Uh, you can't just say clearly this function is odd, right? You got to got to write that down. How are we doing on that? Are we all right. Okay. Okay. So this scary integral just disappeared in a puff of smoke. This integral that I was so concerned about. Uh, that, oh my gosh, that's going to be a nightmare to integrate. Zero, pen down, walk away. No effort, really, particularly. You know, just got to check the conditions. Right. 
So really powerful argument. Now uh, I do want to emphasize uh, there are you know you know how much of an how much argument do you have to give? Uh, what do you have to show? Uh, and I want to point out this is a very context dependent thing, right? So so you know how much you have to show in a course where a symmetry argument is the material, right? Well, you've got to show the whole symmetry argument, right? Uh, and then you know later on, like in your future engineering courses, now nah, they're not going to expect you to show the full symmetry argument. They're going to be happy with just, uh, you know, uh, an assertion that this integral is zero by symmetry. And of course, it's got to be true, right? Uh, but uh, they won't expect you to show all the details. So in this context, since uh, we are, uh, you know, the, the argument itself is what we're learning here, um, I do want to see, at least on this coming second midterm, uh, uh, yeah, missed uh, the complete symmetry argument. So here's what I consider to be a complete symmetry argument. You got to tell me what line you're reflecting over. It's really not obvious. There's a lot of lines out there, right? Uh, sometimes there are multiple lines over which you could make a symmetry argument. So you got to tell me what you're using, right? Um, you likewise have to tell me the formula for uh, how one reflects over that line. Um, you're going to have to uh, state for the record that the function has odd symmetry. <coughs> Again, critical part of the argument. Uh, and you have to show that the function has that odd symmetry. Again, it's not geometrically obvious, and so you, I want to see that algebra. you got to you know, do it out like we just did in that last example. Um, you also have to doff the cap in recognition that it is essential for the argument to work that the domain be symmetric. So you do have to write down and assert that the domain is symmetric. Now that said, you don't have to demonstrate that the domain is symmetric because, I mean, it's usually, a, it's usually if you have a reasonably uh, accurate uh, picture of what the domain looks like, it's usually kind of eyeball obvious. You know, uh, symmetric domains usually just kind of geometry. And uh, so I don't uh, feel the need for you all to write down, you know, stuff like this. I, I put this in here just to, just to make sure that everyone was comfortable with my assertion, right? And you might find this useful if you're not sure if a domain is symmetric, but this is all optional. You don't have to write down the justification. You do, again, have to write down that the domain is symmetric. Okay, so these are the five uh, requirements to make a symmetry argument, um, at least for exam two. We'll reevaluate after that. Um, and uh, I also want to point out a, a warning. Um, you you got to be really careful with symmetry arguments. It's not all upside. It's kind of a, oh, there's a landmine related to this. So let me explain what's dangerous about it. When a symmetry argument works, uh, you check a couple of things, boom, the integral is zero. You get to uh, save yourself a bunch of trouble. And that's very tempting. It's alluring. But it is also a rigid, delicate argument. It, all of the conditions have to be checked. And if any of those actually fails, then there is no symmetry argument to be made. It doesn't work. And then if you think about it, well, okay, well, yeah, but if the symmetry argument doesn't work, then anything that the student has written down in an attempt to make a symmetry argument uh, is progress toward a dead end. It's not progress toward a solution. It's irrelevant to the question, uh, in fact. And so that's the dangerous thing, is you could spend some time documenting uh, you know the complete symmetry argument, and but if it if it doesn't actually hold water, then it's all useless. And that's very hard for me to justify partial credit for writing down stuff that actually doesn't lead anywhere useful. Yeah, question. Oh yes, yeah, so like if, if in a problem you prove that f composed of negative x y is equal to negative f of x y, does that cover both grounds that the function is both symmetric and odd, or is it just prove that well? So the function only has to be odd. Right? So it's the domain that has to be symmetric. And the domain and the integrand are completely independent of each other. So yeah, sadly, no. Yeah, you do have to, you know, uh, um, of course, we should really always draw a picture, right? Uh, but you have to uh, at least understand the shape of the domain uh, in such a way that you can argue 
uh, and be correct that the domain is symmetric. Yeah, that's a it's a separate thing, sadly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So heads up, be careful. Uh, if you're going to use a symmetry argument, you know you don't want to accidentally step on the landmine. It's uh, tragic when that happens. And that said, uh, I, I think I may have said this um, before spring break, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, sure, it's a little dangerous. Yeah, you got to be careful, but it's still an awesome tool. And so my, you know, memory of years ago in you know my past life as a uh, as a uh, physics major. Um, I think about 20% of the integrals that I had to deal with as part of the physics major, zero by symmetry. And that's a big number, 20%, right? And I can't prove that. I don't have documentation. But it was in that ballpark. Tons and tons and tons of integrals can be argued to be zero by symmetry. So it's very, very powerful, very useful. Okay, so here's an example of uh, some, uh, here is a question, and then here is the resulting student work, uh, hypothetical student work, and I just want to point out, you know, uh, how this is going to be graded on an exam, uh, well, on exam two, it, you know, to whatever extent it might show up there, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, might be something that a student would write down, but there's a ton of stuff that's missing from this argument. Uh, so let's see here. Let's get all this onto the page. Uh, this student uh, says the domain is symmetric, right, right here. Uh, and the student says uh, that the function has odd symmetry. Uh, but this student has uh, not indicated what line of symmetry <coughs> they're using. There's a, the, the, the domain has several lines of symmetry. It's not clear uh, over which line of symmetry the function ha is odd. Right? It really depends on the line. Uh, the student has not written down the formula for the reflection. The student has not subsequently used that reflection uh, to demonstrate uh, that the function is odd. So there's just a ton of stuff missing here. So uh, this student would have done two of the five. This student would probably get in the ballpark of 40% of the available points. So anyway, don't don't let this be you. Make sure to think through and document all five of the required steps. Yeah. Um, what would the line of symmetry be for that? Oh yeah, sure. Let's think that through. Um, uh, okay, let's see here. Let me zoom back in. Uh, okay, our domain <coughs> is. I'm gonna draw a picture here. Uh, our domain is uh, the uh, the unit square here, right? And uh, so now our candidate lines are that that oh no, that's terrible uh, that uh, that and that, right? And I could I uh, any one of these four maybe might be something that might work, and I sort of have to think through which one actually would. And uh, this is the one that actually works. And I'm going to do a, an example um, uh, closely related to this to sh talk about how to do a reflection over, you know, 45 degree type lines and that sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's the that's the line in question. Okay. All right. So here's another example. Now, um, <clears throat> so weird shape, right? Uh, notice if you were to come at this integral in a sort of a brute force uh, sort of approach, uh, you're going to be hitting corners. Whichever way you slice, this is at best three separate integrals. And I guess it's a polynomial, so I'm not too scared of the, uh, of the integrand, but still, right? I mean, it's, it seems like it'd be a lot to write down. Um, okay, so having drawn this domain, and you know, again, thinking about what your domain is, I argue it's symmetric over that line, pure geometric appeal. Everybody buy that? Okay, so I have a line of symmetry. Uh, and now let's talk about what the formula for reflection would look like if I were going to reflect over that line. You know, if I were to look at a point here and reflect over to a point over there, how does that work? And this is a tricky bit, so I have a little side work over here, a little side diagram. And uh, this point, I like to think of it as 
uh, having this kind of frame attached to it. All right, I can see the X and the Y, and so let's make this little rectangular frame. And the line being a 45 degree line, uh, I think it's a reasonably believable argument that that rectangular frame would reflect uh, kind of like this. Now again, that's a purely geometric appeal, right? But if this is a 45 degree line, then this green horizontal is going to become this green vertical. And, uh, you know, but down instead of up because, uh, again, just a geometric appeal. And so uh, this point X comma Y, when it reflects, if I want to talk about the reflection here, I mean, I could read the coordinates of the reflection right off of this picture. The X coordinate is minus Y. And the y coordinate is minus x. Everybody see that from this picture? Uh, so that gives us, uh, you know, let me just, here we go. That gives us uh, this formula <coughs> for the reflection. Okay, so we have our line, we have our reflection. We've already uh, observed uh, that the domain is symmetric, but let me go ahead and uh, uh, observe that I've written that down. Again, you've got to write it down, right? Uh, and uh, now we just need to show that the function is odd. Uh, claim and show that the function is odd. So here, I show, here I'm claiming that it's odd. And then notice here again is where I plug in the reflection. There's the reflection. Right, and so in my original function, and I can see that this is this feels weird as you do it. Uh, let me clean up to avoid the distractions. Uh, when you take uh, this function f, but you evaluate at negative y comma x, then negative y goes where the x was. because that's the first input, right? And then likewise, uh, negative x goes where the y was, because that's the second input. And I know that's going to feel a little weird, right? But uh, that's, uh, that's how that works. And so then, uh, again, algebra ensues. And this, is, this one in particular is very much not obvious. It's certainly not obvious to me. Uh, without actually cranking out the algebra. Uh, but uh, when you plug in, like so, and get that expression, and then you rewrite, you know, um, remember all that algebra stuff from high school, sure enough, it turns out that you get the required minus sign. Is that cool? So I don't have to deal with the nightmare of the corners and stuff. This integral is zero by symmetry. We walk away. No integrating. Yes? Um, I guess in this case, it, I guess it makes more sense because you're reflecting like, over like, the positive and negative sides. The, the integral would be zero. But then in the example above, I'm just saying why. In this example here? Oh, yeah, so, so you're conflating inputs to the function and outputs from the function, right? So you're right that all this whole domain is above the x-axis, but I'm not adding up values of the inputs. I'm adding up, you look at the integral, right? I'm, I'm adding up values of the function, right? So this function uh, over here where x is small but y is big, over here the value of the function is negative, right? So f is negative in this whole sort of upper triangle, does that make sense? Yeah. And and then it's positive down here, and then they cancel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Can you go over why the reflection of the second example is negative y, negative x? Uh, yeah, so again, that's just, it comes from the geometry uh, of this picture here, right? I mean, so we, we start with this as our line that we're, we're reflecting over, and I make this argument about how this rectangular frame, its reflection is that rectangular frame. Now, that's the geometric appeal. Is that, are you willing to believe that? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Um, and so then I just have to write, think about well, what are the coordinates of this reflected point. And the x coordinate, you got to keep in mind, it's not about the alphabet, right? It's about you know, x coordinate means what is the, you know, in this direction, 
you know, what is the what is the coordinate of this point down here? And it's negative y. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And then likewise, the uh, second coordinate is okay. Well, what is the coordinate in in that direction? And well, it's negative x. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So in this example, for the five steps, the second uh -huh. step is the reflection r x comma y. Uh -huh. Where would that be in this example? Right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. 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 Okay. Alrighty. Okay, here's another one. Uh, now this is uh, yeah. the fact that this is the landmine is uh, is given away and what I have on the screen here. Um, but I want to point out how easy it would be to step on the landmine, right? So a lot of students would look at this y cubed and be like, "Oop, odd power." Odd. When you put a minus sign in there, and the you're going to get a, a negative cubed, which is negative. So there's my oddness. And then you look at the picture of this domain, and you think, oh, okay, well, I can draw an easy picture of that domain. Uh, the points are, let's see, negative 1, 0, and 1, 0 are like that, and then 0, 2 is like this. And, oh, look, it's a nice symmetric domain. Boom, integral is 0 by symmetry. You can imagine a student would be tempted uh, by that. And it absolutely doesn't work. There's no symmetry argument to be made here because the symmetry of the domain is over the y-axis. But the symmetry of the integrand, in order, for, uh, in order for this integrand to be odd, I need to reflect over the x-axis in order for the reflected second coordinate to be negative y. So two different lines. The argument fails. There is no symmetry argument here. Does that make sense to everybody? You see how dangerous it is, right? Because it's tempting. It's very tempting. So don't uh, casual glance. Don't try to get. Don't try to benefit too much uh, from uh, from symmetry arguments. You got to put in the time, document, and be careful, and check all the boxes. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, uh, the same thing works in three dimensions. Well, you know, morally the same. Uh, so again, we can talk about what it means to do a reflection. Now in three dimensions, well, of course, just like uh, every bathroom mirror in the world, um, this is what a reflection is. Right? It's exactly what you think. Um, again, we analogously define uh, what we mean by an odd function and a symmetric domain. Oops, missed, uh, there we go. Right. So an odd function uh, gets a minus sign on the value of the function when you reflect the input. A symmetric <coughs> domain is this any set that is its own reflection. And with that stated, nobody will be surprised, I'm guessing, that we get the totally analogous theorem. So again, if you have a uh, an odd integrand and a symmetric domain, then your integral is zero. Now, triple integral. Right. So again, massive, massive benefit. Uh, again, same warnings. You do have to check both of the conditions. Please be very careful about that, right? Uh, uh, a symmetric domain is not good enough. Got to have the oddness as well. And again, it's got to be the same plane for both. Okay. All right. So here is a uh, uh, our last example. Uh, this is uh, triple integral, of course, and uh, this is a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Mostly because of the shape of the domain. You look at our domain here. It's the unit ball, and y'all will recall um, how stuff goes down when you're integrating over the unit ball, and as you slice, you get square roots all over your bounds. And so there's going to be uh, just horrifying expressions in here. Right? So nobody wants that. Um, okay, so we're going to use a symmetry argument. And uh, let me try to give away the game as I go. Um, I make this assertion here that I want to use the xy plane. Let me, uh, let me reveal why. 
Where did I come up with this idea of the XY plane specifically? Why not the YZ plane? Why not any of the other countless, literally countless, uh, planes that the ball is symmetric through? Right? In fact, any plane through the origin, the domain is symmetric. Right? So why am I picking this plane specifically? Um, and it's because I'm kind of trying to sort of reverse engineer. I know that I want my integrand here to be odd, and I'm just strategizing. So we can, again, it's kind of work backwards. I look at that integrand, and I think to myself, yeah, I like that three. Right? This, I, I feel like if, I, if I'm going to get oddness to work out, I'm going to have to capitalize on the fact that there's a cube here. And minuses, when they get cubed, stay minuses. Right? Not, not squares. Squares make minuses go away. That's no good. That's not what I need. So... I'm hoping to capitalize on that cube. That motivates that I would like for this to be my formula for my reflection. Now, this is just wishful thinking. I haven't, I haven't demonstrated anything yet, right? I'm just thinking, wouldn't that be nice if this was my formula for my reflection? Minus z goes in the place of z. Then I see there's that minus sign that would get cubed, and it would stay minus, and then I get my oddness that I want. And then I have to ask myself, is this a reflection at all? And if so, what is this a reflection through? And uh, you can uh, draw yourself a, a quick picture if you like, um, but uh, changing only the z coordinate by a negative, leaving x and y the same, uh, I claim that reflection through the xy plane is what's going to make that the formula for the reflection. So that's where I got the XY plane from. I literally kind of worked backwards to the choice from wishful thinking about how I want the oddness argument to go down. Uh, and of course, now you can see that that actually is how the argument goes down. Here's my oddness argument right there. And you can see it's because I get this minus Z right there that I get a minus cubed which is the minus sign that I ultimately need uh, to, uh, you know, to make uh, to make what I want actually happen. Does everybody buy it? So again, we just bypassed a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, even in spherical coordinates, this wouldn't be any fun. Right? Much better here to make this symmetry argument. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, yeah, my own personal opinion is that the book undersells symmetry arguments. I think it's a totally awesome. It's uh, on my top two list of best integration techniques because of how often it comes up in the real world, right? Not in manufactured, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, math class only, uh, you know, no, but in, in practical real world scenarios such as I saw a ton of in my physics major. Um, this comes up tremendous amount. So very, very powerful technique. Okay. All right. Um, oh, yeah, question. Sorry, how did you pick, um, when you were looking at the symmetry, why did you pick negative z? <coughs> like, why did you pick something z negative? Yeah, but I, again, I kind of reverse engineered it. I wanted this minus sign in the reflection so that this, so that, you know, when that minus sign got cubed, I would get the minus sign that I need, right? And I, so I wanted that because I saw the three there. Uh, and I saw the other two exponents are even, and that's just not going to, you know, algebraically, I know that it, I can see the fail coming. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, 5.6. Um, there's some applications here. Um, I'm going to go through this stuff pretty quickly because uh, there's some nice just punch lines of uh, formulas that we're going to be using. Um, but uh, these, these applications kind of stack on top of each other, so I do think it's a good thing to talk through. Uh, first, let's talk about how to average numbers. I think you all know how to average numbers. All right, old news. Um, <clears throat> but you could make the case that this averaging that I'm doing here, I'm averaging arguably six numbers, but also arguably three numbers, four, seven, and eight. Right? In, in a way, right? Um, the only thing is, is that, yeah, it's an average of 4, 7, and 8, uh, but 4 counts twice, right? Because 
four, there it is. It counts twice in the summation in the numerator, but it also arguably counts twice in what you could view as being a summation in the denominator. Right? And so that can be rewritten like that. And uh, then you'll notice the same thing for like the eight here. Right? It sort of counts three times, arguably in both the numerator and the denominator. And notice that in both of these cases, the expression, uh, here, let me do it like this. This expression and this expression have the same form. They all look kind of like this. So uh, what we're going to do just to have uh, sort of a streamlining of the expression, uh, we're going to rewrite where these numbers here we call the weights. Uh, so when you're doing an, an average, and if a number appears twice, you can, again, you can view this as two separate numbers. I know, that's fine, but, but it's nice to view this as one number that counts twice, or said differently, one number that has a weight of two. Because that's how it plays out in the, uh, in the, in the algebra there. So uh, we're going to use this expression uh, as a definition of what, what we call a weighted average. Uh, you can see that the numbers that we're averaging go there, and then the weights, namely how many times you count them, go there. Neat trick. Okay, so uh, here's an example. Uh, this is actually relevant to uh, how course grades are computed in this class. Uh, now, of course, this is all documented on the class webpage. I know you all have looked at that, uh, but uh, you're going to notice very prominently in the formula for how we do course grades. Uh, it's a weighted average, right? And so this is how this plays out. So uh, now in this hypothetical, uh, you know, Bob's class, uh, the weights uh, for the three midterm exams are 20% each, and then the weight for the final exam is 40%. Now that's not exactly the weights in our class, right? But it's not far off, and you can work by analogy. I didn't want the arithmetic to get out of hand in this example. Um, but uh, so in this example, those are the weights and you can see those weights right where they're supposed to be. Um, Bob didn't do so great on the first exam, but he brought it up for the second exam. Uh, and then uh, the third exam, well, late in the semester, I don't know, he had a bad day, something like that. But then he brought it, at, brought it up on the final like so. And so you can see those values go right there, just like they're supposed to in the above formula. Crank out the arithmetic, and uh, Bob's course average, namely the weighted average of these numbers with these weights, is uh, is that which is a B. Anybody see how that works? Well, you don't worry about the arithmetic. You can trust me on the arithmetic. Uh, everybody buy it? Okay. So again, keep in mind this is how. Uh, this is the concept of weighted average that we're using in this course. Okay. Uh, okay. By the way, while we're on it, uh, let me just remind y'all, um, if you don't feel like you're just 100% comfortable with how course grades are computed, come talk to me. I'll be very happy to explain it, flesh it out all you need. Just come, come to office hours. I'll be happy any time to discuss. Okay. So that's how you uh, do weighted average. Um, <clears throat> the average value of a function uses this idea. The average value of a function is a kind of a weighted average. Uh, it's just that we use specifically size in the domain as the weights. That's all it is. And in fact, you can see uh, right here, here is those weights, right? Any little subinterval, any little piece of your domain of size dx, delta x if you prefer, right? That size is the weight that we attach uh, to the value of the function at points in that interval. 
and they just add up. So again, uh, weighted average, uh, and uh, this uh, then is the, uh, the the general formula for the average value of a function. Uh, you will notice that this simplifies pretty nicely. Uh, the, this denominator is just b minus a, so we might as well streamline that like so. And so slightly more streamlined version of average value of a function is like that. So uh, now I'm going to leave as an exercise for you all to plug in for uh, sine x on the interval from 0 to pi and the average value computation works out to be 2 pi. That's all single variable calculus. You may have even seen something like that before. Okay. <coughs> Where it gets different is if we use this formula for a multivariable function. Right? But still the same idea. We're still going to use size in the domain as our weights. Size is now area instead of width. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, and again, the denominator simplifies very easily. And again, we now have a general formula for how to find the average value of a function, and again, kind of plug and chug. So uh, if, uh, if you want to find the average value of this function on the unit disk, now the fact that we're doing it on the unit disk is going to show up twice. On the one hand, the fact that it's the unit disk gives me my domain for my integral, but the fact that it's the unit disk also tells me what I'm dividing by, which is namely the area of the unit disk, which of course is pi. And again, a bunch of calculus, right? And so again, I'm going to leave that as a uh, nice, easy exercise for y'all. Notice that what I've done here is uh, I've done this integral in polar coordinates, and it makes it quite a bit easier to compute that integral, and yada, 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 and then the final answer is one-fourth is an oddly simple answer for a question where I see pies and trig all over the place. It uh, doesn't seem like it ought to work out that easy, but isn't that nice? Okay. Everybody all right? Okay. Okay, so we talked about weighted averages. Now we've talked about the average value of a function, and now we can do a little bit of physics. And this is not a physics course, so I'm not going to dwell on the physics, right? But... Um, a very reasonable point of view on what we call center of mass. You all probably seen center of mass in various different contexts. Um, and there's different points of view on it, to be fair. Turns out, it is a weighted average. Uh, specifically, it's a weighted average of position. So where the masses are that's what you're taking a weighted average of. And then, of course, you're going to use, well, the weights. How heavy are they? The weights are the weights. Seems like a reasonable computation to do anyway. Anyway, it turns out that this is uh, 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 an expression that's very natural in physics in um, lots of different ways. Uh, and uh, it is ultimately a weighted average. Okay. Uh, so now again, this is a discrete case where I only had two pieces of mass. Uh, just like we did above, you can do this uh, for um, uh, for a continuum, right? And again, we're going to use the weights as the weights, right? E each little piece, the amount of mass, how heavy is that piece is going to be the weight in the weighted average. And we're taking as before a weighted average of position. And position, of course, is just uh, its coordinates. So uh, again, there you go as our formula. Now, I want to recognize that this expression right here, we haven't actually technically defined this yet. Uh, it's a little uncomfortable. It's a double integral. We know how to do double integrals. We've talked about dm, as this is just kind of an integral notation shorthand for density times dA. But what does it mean to take an integral of a vector? Never talked about that before. Right? So good news, it's actually a pretty easy thing to talk about. Um, uh, this is a vector. The integral of a vector 
is just a vector of individual integrals. It's exactly what you would hope it would be. You, in other words, you do the integral one coordinate at a time. So this x vector, you'll notice its coordinates x1 through xn, and you just do those uh, separately. So the uh, altogether, the weighted average of position um, uh, has these coordinates, like so. All right. So to see an example, let's see, how are we doing on time, by the way? Ew. Oh, you know what? I am kind of out of time. Okay. Um, fair is fair. Okay, we're drawing the line right there. Um, so do keep in mind that today is the last day of fair game material for the class um, and uh, for exam two. Uh, so, uh, yeah. See you all later. Good luck with your studying.